Hello, I'm Mario Taniguzzi, Managing Editor of Canada's Podcast. Today, my guest on Calgary's podcast is Carolyn Schofield, who is a social media manager and the owner of Savvy Socialite. Thanks for joining us today, Carolyn. Thank you so much for having me, Mario. Really appreciate it. Well, let me just ask you to start off our conversation here. Tell me a little bit about Savvy Socialite and, and, and what it is and what you do. Sure. Um, well, why don't we dial it back before we get to Savvy Socialite and I'll tell you how I got here, um, which will allow me to elaborate as to what Savvy Socialite does. Sure. Um, so I had a very unique childhood. Um, I was born in Canada, but I was raised in the UK. Uh, most of my elementary schooling was done between Nottingham and West Yorkshire. Um, I came back to Canada for junior high, mostly in Edmonton. Um, and my first mentor in life actually was my basketball coach and math teacher, Kent Ferris, who's now on the Edmonton Public School Board. Um, he identified me very early on as being one of those, you know, gifted, unique individuals. And uh, but he also was able to identify my shortcomings. So I was that person who had to come to basketball 45 minutes early to practice the shots off the net because, you know, yeah. I was a center and I just had to get those, you know, up close shots down. Um, he clued in really quickly that I became bored with the curriculum because of how high I functioned. And he actually ushered in a course called Enterprise and Innovations, which was my very first introduction to business. Um, mm -hmm. This brought forward concepts involving um, inventory, supply and demand, pricing, and kind of an introduction to advertising. Um, by the end of that course, I was only 14. Um, we had organized, sang, presented, done a talent show that made enough money to get us all basketball jerseys for the basketball team. And they were nice jerseys. So we made a serious profit off of that. And then unfortunately, I had suffered a very traumatic event the following summer, um, which changed my trajectory on a full 180. Um, I ended up being a very dark teenager. Uh, by the time I didn't fully graduate high school, uh, I went into the hospitality industry and I started modeling, uh, but I was also pulling wrenches. I used to uh, work on cars, pulling wrenches. And uh, by the time I was 24, I had landed what I thought at the time was my dream job. I got a job as an office manager at a firm in Edmonton. And at the time I thought I'd made it, you know, I thought this is it, I'll work my way up. This is how life goes. Um, one day I was walking to the parts department and there was a Rottweiler there. I went to go pet it and it tore apart the lower half of my face. Oh my. Um, this changed everything. This completely turned my life around in at first a bad way, but sort of a good way. So yeah. what had happened from that is I, I, I developed PTSD. I was shortly after developed, um, diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome. And the doctors told me I would never have my own children. So it was kind of a bleak outlook, you know, from 24, I was like, okay, this is, this isn't even looking good. Um, but I did a lot of counseling and I relocated from Edmonton to Calgary. Now, instead of being in front of the camera as a model, I moved behind the camera and I started taking mm -hmm. photos and I started a blog. Um, now that blog started talking about mental health, fashion endeavors, such things like that. Um, and before I knew it with the help of uh, Twitter and Reddit, uh, my subject matter was becoming quite viral. Um, and, you know, by 2015, I had a massive amount of network of photographers, models, event planners, um, you know, all the top fashion industry people in Calgary were kind of at my fingertips. Um, the blog had gone viral. I had over 20,000 followers, 180,000 views. And I really started to kind of make a name for myself. And I also advocated for the safety of up and coming models. Um, cause I knew a lot of the people, so I could say, you know, yes, work with this person. They're safe, you know, with concerns like we see with Epstein trial right now, it, you know, it can be a very dark industry. Um, 2016 rolled around and I was given the biggest blessing of my life. I had my little girl, uh, against all odds. Um, and I took time off to raise her and her half brother at the time. Um, but my dreams were never far away. In fact, they were more apparent now that I had a little girl and I had somebody to, you know, make an example for. So 2019, I went back to work and I started working with the Natural Talent Alliance. Uh, they worked on their arts and fashion professionals who worked on philanthropic endeavors in Calgary and in Victoria, uh, BC. Um, so we worked with the MS Society of Calgary and we also did an ocean conservation project that took uh, reclaimed ocean garbage and fashioned it into actual fashion garments oh. that we then, yeah, really cool, right? 
uh, that we then uh, showcased on the Canada's longest runway at the Victoria International Marina, which mm -hmm. brings me to almost where we are now. So uh, the team needed assistance in the capital raise. So I identified people within the Calgary market as to who could potentially help us or donate to our endeavor. And I met the most pivotal mentor in my life, who you are very familiar with, Mr. Frank Lonardelli, uh, CEO of Arlington Street Investments here in Calgary, development firm for those who don't know, and it's on a previous episodes with Mario and several <laughs> articles. Um, he, we met Tino you know, to talk about a donation and he asked me similar questions, you know, how I got here, whatnot. And instead of providing us with a donation, he provided me with an offer of a lifetime and offered me a position at ASI uh, as his executive assistant to a CEO. Now, I think, you know, CEO, the word gets tossed around a lot these days because there are very many entrepreneurs. I'm a CEO, you know, and, and that's great that, you know, absolutely empower yourselves. But when you work with a real CEO, I mean, someone who's got, you know, $1.6 billion in assets and management, um, you know, you really learn that these individuals are very particular, they're very driven. Um, you have to be able to pivot at a moment's notice. They are a walking risk assessment management. You know, they get posed a venture and within two minutes, they've already conduct risk analysis, uh, legal considerations, cost analysis, trend analysis, and the projected ROI. They go from concept to uh, reality so fast that you not have to not only be able to keep up, but also anticipate what is coming. Um, and this really changed my mindset moving forward. So while I was flourishing at my dream and my career job and really getting into the Calgary business scene, uh, my home life sadly was deteriorating. Um, I was with a partner who did not appreciate that I was working with top business professionals who became very you know, jealous, whatnot, arguments ensued. And my mental health just took such a big turn that by spring of 2020, I, I had to take a mental leave from ASI. And Frank fully supported me through it all. Um, 2021 came around. Uh, I left my ex in the summer of 2020. And Frank and I met again. And, you know, I was looking at maybe coming back to ASI. And he said, well, why don't you do this? Why don't you start your own endeavor? You know, you're a single mom. Why don't you have, you know, you can do all of this stuff already on your own. I'll be your first client. Start your own business. I, I didn't know the first thing about starting a business, but I went, okay. Yeah. So I, I went ahead and launched it. And now I have Savvy Socialites. So Savvy Socialites started as a social media firm and PR um, to assist small businesses with their endeavors. So you're not looking at paying the um, large margins that you're covering when you're dealing with an agency, Right. Um, so that was kind of the initial point to that. Um, so shortly after I'd started my business, I actually went back to school. I enrolled at Bow Valley College um, and uh, took my business diploma in marketing. And uh, I met my next mentor, who's Christa, Christy Callez, and she was the introduction to management um, instructor who brought me on for the Alberta Teen uh, Deans of Business case competition. Mm -hmm. Now, that was interesting because as much as I was becoming a good uh, professional on my own, I hadn't fully learned how to navigate a very tight team environment. And I feel like that's the other part that comes into professionalism, right? There's individual and then there's teams. Um, so the very first time we did it, it did not work out. We didn't win. We didn't even place. Uh, we had a breakdown in communication in the war room. You know, it was, it was a real learning. The second year, nobody else returned except me. I guess I'm a glutton for punishment that way. I was already taking five courses, single mom, running a business. So why not do it again, right? And uh, that's what entrepreneurs do. We just juggle everything and keep it up high. Yeah. Um, so we did it the second year. And this time it was completely different. We had a team of respected individuals where everybody just mutually understood the weaknesses and stepped in to bring their strengths forward and just compliment each other in such a way that propelled us to when we came to the war room day, we were proposed a solution for a local VR tech company, uh, Red Iron Labs, and they had a VR software that we ended up positioning to special needs individuals. Um, we thought the angle to it would be interesting because there's a lot of things uh, able-bodied people take for granted uh, that people with physical or mental limitations may not be able to experience. So VR allows them to go somewhere and experience that. So that really thrust us to a second place win. 
and uh, really took right off. Um, so I really got to learn strategy from an educational perspective, but also from the perspective of a top and developing CEO. Yeah. Um, after that, I graduated uh, a semester early uh, with my daughter yelling from the, the backstage, yay, mommy! <laughs> And uh, and then I went and renegotiated my contract with Frank, and now I run the marketing operations across ten separate entities, and I can balance the budget across two hundred items and across those entities. And right. insert obvious Canadian political joke here about balancing budgets. Right. But uh, that's that's how I got to here. So what uh, you know, as an entrepreneur, and uh, you know. Uh, a young entrepreneur in the sense of starting a, a business. Uh, what what do you say the, the toughest challenge was to start a oh, business? Oh my gosh. I think the toughest challenge is, is, I mean, A, you have to balance your budget. So that in itself is that um, you're in charge of your own billing. So if you don't track, you don't get paid. You yeah. know, it's, it's not the same That's as you, know, you, you have a nine to five job. You go to work, you can take an hour to go scroll Facebook, Right. And yeah. you still get paid. I, I don't I don't get that. You know, I, what I do is what I bill for and what I bill for is what I get paid. Yeah. Um, I think my biggest mistake in the outset was not accounting for my applied overhead. Um, it really skewed my margins when I was bringing on new clients. I couldn't figure out why I wasn't quite making enough for what I was putting out. So, you know, learning that was a, a very unique um, experience. And then furthermore, when it comes to marketing or social media, you know, what, how do you become trusted? Why should people buy from you? You know, um, yeah. Yeah. people are starting to really become, you know, empathetic to in, in, uh, inauthenticity, you know, they can, they can see the fakeness. Um, you True. know, yeah. people don't want to keep up with the Kardashians anymore. Nobody wants to be a <laughs> Kardashian. Nobody wants to be perfect. You know, yeah. they want grit, they want integrity and they want authentic authenticity. Um, so, yeah, I think those are probably the hardest parts to navigate yeah. starting a marketing business. So, you know, the uh, uh, I have a friend of mine who's an artist, uh, quite an accomplished artist. And I remember him years ago telling me, he said, you know, I really have two jobs. I have my job as an artist, but then I have my job as my a business uh, person, right, uh, for my company. Uh, so how do you, you know... It is a challenge, but how do you juggle that? How do you uh, do you uh, do you set time aside to do the business part, you know, uh, and get the things done that you need done? Or... I I think again, skills I learned with being so close to Frank is just scheduling reminders, organization, and calendars. Your calendar is your best friend. Yeah. Um, you know, I have to remind myself today is invoicing time. The end of the day, do your database, write down everything that you did. And I mean everything, because if you don't track an action, that's where you're going to have a gap. And if you've got a gap, then you got a problem. Um, so yeah. it's, it's very yeah. important to be transparent, not only with what you're doing, but what you're not doing too. You know, like if, if you're not making enough or if you're feeling like you're not connecting enough with the right demographic. You have to ask yourself, what am I not doing? You can't keep doing the same thing and expect a different result. You know, you you have to keep changing and growing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Let's talk a little bit about social media and uh, uh, obviously uh, uh, a business for you, uh, I, but also I'm sure probably a passion, uh, of, of interest. Tell me why companies need to be in the social media uh, sphere, I guess. Sure. Well, when we look at how marketing has changed, you know, in the last a decade to even decade and a half, and you're very familiar with this with your background, we, we were print before and TV and radio and maybe yeah. a bit of, you know, internet pop ups, something like that. But um, since MySpace and more importantly, the meta programs, you know, Facebook and Instagram, consumer advertising has completely changed. Um, your social media managers are now the front line of your business's public relations. Uh, they are the voice to your brand messaging. And if you have a dedicated social media manager that can engage regularly in a voice that screams integrity, your brand will grow. Uh, I think there's a reason why Elmo a few weeks ago was trending. You know, so many people, grown adults, we are not the demographic for Elmo. Yet 
the person, the social media manager behind that brand went ahead and took that brand. And instead of selling directly, they connected with the consumers in a way that showed that they cared yeah. and it blew up the platforms. It went absolutely nuts because that's what people want. People don't want to be sold. They want to know that you give a damn, you know, it's, it's a big deal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What do you think the most common mistake is that uh, companies or businesses make when it comes to social media? Oh, this one, this one's easy. Uh, so <laughs> um, for small businesses, especially, they expect a social media manager to be a one person octopus. And in the most part, we are, as you can see from my background, you know, we have a little bit of photography, we have a little bit of public speaking, PR, copywriting, um, you know, networking with the right people. There's so many facets that have to go into, you know, it's not just creating a post and writing the copy. But when people, and, and some of these, when I say people, I mean, sometimes even Fortune 500 companies are hiring for a social media manager. They're looking for someone who makes pretty graphics. They want somebody to make a really pretty graphic post. That's not a social media manager. That's a graphic designer. Yeah. There's a big difference. You can make the prettiest post, perfect it, <laughs> go through 10 lines of approvals, finally go ahead and post it, take off, and then sales are, why didn't it go viral? What's going on with the post? Well, you didn't engage. You didn't push it. You didn't look at who's not following you yet. You didn't strategically look at what is in your network and say, this person could be interested and this person, and then go and interact with their environment and what they're doing. So many people think if you just build it, they will come, but it won't without the town crier sitting there going, come on, check it out, check it out. That's what we're there for. Yeah. Um, I feel so many people disconnect right there. They get the calendar made up. They say, this post is going to go out this day, this day, this day. Post goes up, nothing happens. And you see five likes. You see comments, no responses. You know, I, I can't remember what the statistic was. I want to say it was over 80% of consumers expect a social media brand to respond. Most of them within an hour, some up to a day. But yeah. they expect that, you know, click, click. And you can ask our um, stakeholders on, on our platforms, especially for ASI, I've answered stuff at one o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning. And I know, you know, we're supposed to do that whole, uh, you know, growth my or close off your work as of this time of the day. But I don't think that happens for entrepreneurs. I feel like we're just on all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I think that is the biggest drawback there. So how do you know, uh, uh, not to bring up the sort of the, the cliche of our times about work-life balance, but, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and the more I talk to different entrepreneurs, the more I, I, I discover that almost everybody is in the same boat, that the, there is no work-life balance, right? <laughs> uh, but... What do you, I, I guess, what do you do uh, uh, to, to relax and uh, uh, to get away from, from work? Because it is important. Sure. Well, um, for myself, I'm actually, I'm a very country girl, uh, despite the fact that I work with an urban city developer. So yeah. it's, you know, again, the, the, uh, I'm a Gemini that way. I'm very, there's two sides there. Um, I, everything that I do for fun involves my daughter. When I check out it involves my daughter, unless it's the mindfulness. Um, Frank actually encouraged me to start meditating. Uh, so I usually do that at least, uh, at the end of the night around 10 o'clock, um, just, you know, 15, 20 minutes of just quiet, uh, frequency vibrations, stuff like that. Um, I think if you don't take some time for yourself, some, I'm not saying all, I mean, yeah. I'm not saying you go on a six week paid vacation. That's not what on, well, no, that's not what entrepreneurs get. Even if we were on vacation, we would still be responding to emails because True. you can't let it go. You know, it's not like a normal salary employee where you could say I'm on vacation from this time, you know, yeah, exactly. Bye. Yeah. So, but, um, I'm very fortunate that, you know, I can take my daughter to visit my family across province and, you know, we can go out to the country and get some time away from all the hustle and bustle. And, you know, even if we can't do that, then, you know, we put on Mario and we play, well, Mario, Tony, yeah, we play, you know, <laughs> Nintendo. We just love, you know, that's, that's our thing and hang out with my cats and read books. And yeah, I wish I could say, you know, I go to a retreat every six weeks and I get a facial and no <laughs> that doesn't happen no that's true like what would you say um you know if uh you had a young person come to you and uh 
seeking advice, what would you tell them? Uh, uh, you know, best piece of wisdom for becoming an entrepreneur? Sure. Well, I guess I got a, a couple bits were there. I think um, to start off with, no matter what you've been through, just trust the universe. You know, if you're a good person, you care about others, you live with integrity, you will succeed, right? Um, that being said, um, the greatest mindset you can have is to be open to learning. As much as you are an entrepreneur and you are a specialist in your own right, yeah. if you can maintain the mindset that you know nothing and you are constantly learning, then you will do great. If you go around saying, I know it, I got it all figured out, you know, this is how it's going to go. You're dead in the water. Mm. You know, you need to, nobody grows by not adding anything new. So yeah. if everything around you is familiar and comfortable, you're not in a growth mindset, right? A growth mindset is scary. A growth mindset is being in the unknown, dealing with the different, yep. the new, adding in people who are considerably smarter and more accomplished than you and never being able to say, I know better than you. Yeah. Unless you really 200% know better on that one little option, which I will speak up sometimes for social media. Yeah. <laughs> but beyond that, I learn. You know, and, and and I guess this is a uh, kind of similar to that. But uh, how important is it uh, uh, to be able to change, to be able to adapt, and dare I say the word pivot? Uh, you know, uh, you know, depending on circumstances that are thrown your way. It is absolutely imperative. It really, really is. This is not the time to be rigid. Um, this is the time to be open. I mean, careers change, paths change, industries close down. Um, you know, I may be dealing, thankfully I deal with housing. So housing's not going anywhere at this point in time. Um, but you know, people who deal with things like print before print is having, you know, print magazines are having a heck of a time trying to keep up on sales. It's all gone digital, you know? So yeah. if I was a magazine producer and I was so stuck to doing print, I'd be bankrupt by now, you know, like we, we have to move with what's happening. And in social media, especially the algorithm changes literally every week on every platform. Um, I follow Annie May Hodge on LinkedIn. She's a really great social media uh, leader out of the UK. Brilliant. She gives an update every single week as to the new algorithm updates. Um, I think it's just imperative to keep yourself up and up on the details. And that is getting increasingly tricky in Canada, given the restrictions on media now and certain things that we can and cannot say. Yeah. But um, definitely, definitely important to be able to grow, to change and to adapt. Um, what's that movie? Heartbreak Ridge with uh, Clint Eastwood. Um, what does he say? Overcome, adapt. Oh, what is it? It's the military saying. Oh, I can't remember. Anyways. <laughs> But it, yeah, it is. It's. Uh, but I, I just find it interesting how many people, though, are, and not only people, uh, but uh, like industries uh, sometimes just uh, fail to adapt and uh, stay stuck in their ways because why? Because that's the way we always did it, right? Which is I I, hope, I feel like the second somebody comes forward and that is their only backup, that's how we always did it. Yeah, go away. If you don't have solid reasoning, and I said the same thing to my team and the dean's team, if we had a position on a on a case project and you have a better idea, come to me with reasoning and back up and say, we need to do this because of this, 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 and this. And yeah. if your reasoning is sound, I will pivot the entire strategy to follow your sound reasoning. You know, mm -hmm. not just because I already came up with all this idea and I already put 40 hours of effort into it. Yeah. If this idea isn't as good as that idea, I'm going to go with that idea. Not just because I invested my time, but because why would I invest my time on a, you know, half done idea when there's a better one right there, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Super then. Well, thanks very much, uh, Carolyn, for joining us today. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Mario. It's been great. All right. That was Carolyn Schofield, who is social media manager and owner of Savvy Socialite in Calgary. This has been Calgary's podcast. I'm Mario Tonaguzzi, managing editor of Canada's podcast. Thanks for joining us today.